by our guest speaker today, Professor Wang Yasheng. I have a lot to tell you about him, beginning with the fact that he is an associate dean and professor of international management at the Sloan School. He is also in charge of the school's global partnership programs and action learning initiatives. And these are two of the innovative programs that have been initiated in the past seven years. He holds an international program fellowship in Chinese economy and business. And Professor Wang founded and runs the China Lab and the India Lab, which aim to help entrepreneurs in those countries improve their management skills. Now, on top of this, he's also a very distinguished author. His most recent book, Capitalism in Chinese Characteristics, <clears throat> is based on, in typical MIT fashion, detailed archival and quantitative, quantitative evidence spanning three decades of reforms. And he shows that private entrepreneurship, <clears throat> facilitated by financial liberalization and micro, microeconomic flexibility, played a central role in Chinese growth. Capitalism in Chinese Characteristics was selected by The Economist magazine as one of the best books published in 2008. He has also published in Chinese, including the transformation of the Chinese private sector, What Exactly is China Model, which is another award-winning book, the won the Blue Lion Prize for the best book published in 2011, and The Path of Big Enterprises. Two other books in Chinese, <clears throat> one on China, model and urbanization, and the other one on the university and entrepreneur, entrepreneurship development are forthcoming this year. I'm almost there. You'll get him in a moment. In 2010, he was named by the National Asia Research Program as one of the most outstanding scholars in the United States, conducting research on issues of policy importance to the United States. He has held and received prestigious fellowships, such as the National Fellowship Award at Stanford University, and the Social Science Council MacArthur Fellowship. He is down from a school from down the river, but he's become a very valued part of the MIT family. Please join me in giving me a warm and most deserved welcoming to Professor Yasheng Wang. <laughs> and I'm sorry, I flubbed the last line. It's Wang Yasheng. <laughs> Thank you, Jerry. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Jerry. And uh, I have to say, crossing the river from the other side uh, is very easy, and uh, especially uh, not during the winter. And, and uh, I have uh, found uh, Amity Sloan to be just an incredible place to do research and to create things. And MIT and MIT Sloan are very entrepreneurial. And um, you know, here you have uh, faculty who will come to the dean's office and say, I want to do X, Y, and Z. And the deans will say, are you sure you want to do these things? Even though the deans are not sure, they will give the license to the faculty to do these things. The G Lab was created that way. There was a lot of uh, you know, uh, skepticism at the time in uh, 2000, uh, 1999, whether that was going to be successful. And now this is one of the, uh, the flagship uh, courses. And following on that, uh, we created uh, China India Labs in uh, 2008. Uh, we have worked with Goldman Sachs um, to help train uh, women entrepreneurs uh, in China through uh, China Lab. Uh, this year, we started working with Tata Center at the engineering school at MIT in India Lab. They have fantastic technologies and they have fantastic product developments. Uh, India Lab uh, would uh, uh, help them figure out uh, what the commercial solutions uh, are. And it's a very good combination of the technological expertise of MIT with the commercial application capability of uh, MIT Sloan School. So I'm very happy to be involved in all these uh, activities. And obviously, uh, all of, the, the, all of the, the, these things are made possible by your support, uh, by your uh, 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 um, uh, willingness to come back to our school and to connect with us. Thank you so much. So let me uh, get to the, uh, the topic. Uh, uh, I can talk about that, but uh, since the uh, screen uh, gives a different topic, uh, I, should, I should talk about that. Uh, by the way, uh, 
Uh, by the way, pl please feel free to interrupt me anytime uh, you want. Uh, I'm an academic, so I'm very used to being treated very rudely. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, uh, it's, uh, once I put on a slide like this, and then the, uh, one hand went up in the seminar room and said, uh, why, why do you want to do this topic uh, in the first place? <laughs> and I spent 15 minutes explaining that. Uh, so the downside of that is I may not be able to go through uh, all the slides, but, but I think making it interactive can be, uh, can be uh, uh, rich uh, experience as well. So today I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, democracy and growth, and I'm doing it in a very peculiar way, which is to choose a country that is not uh, democratic. Uh, at least it's not democratic by conventional uh, uh, measures. You know, we can have argument whether or not there is substantive democracy in China as opposed to procedural democracy. But if we use conventional measures, there's no question China is, uh, is not a democracy. Uh, I hope why there is a connection between this debate on democracy and growth and China, I hope that connection will become clear. And in fact, this is a debate that uh, Chinese scholars and uh, both outside of China as well as uh, within China are having a debate about, about the next stage of reforms and the current leadership which came into power in late 2012 has outlined a very ambitious economic reform agenda. The issue there is that without political reforms, whether or not these economic reforms can be implemented. I don't have a very good, um, how should I say, I, I'm not optimistic. Without political reforms, you can make economic reforms happen. But let me lay out the facts and maybe we can have a debate about that. Uh, in terms of the agenda for the talk, in, in case I don't go through all the slides, at least I want to highlight what uh, are in my presentation. I'm going to present first some global evidence on democracy and growth. Right? So this is statistical analysis of lots of countries rather than just on one or two countries. And then I'm going to talk about the experience of East Asia, and specifically there, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, Korea, uh, South Korea, uh, Taiwan, uh, not North Korea. Uh, in fact, there was a debate in the 1960s between two economists, <coughs> one from the left, the other from the right. They found it very surprising that at that debate, they agreed on each other about the prospects of uh, growth for, North, uh, for Korea. Only later on did they find out that the left-leaning uh, economist was thinking about North Korea, and the right-leaning economist was thinking about South Korea. And they had no idea when they had a debate that uh, they were actually thinking about different countries. So, uh, so let me make it clear that I'm uh, going to talk about South Korea rather than North Korea. And then I'm going to talk about uh, sort of this perennial debate about China vis-a-vis -vis, uh, India. Uh, it's a fascinating debate, and I have participated uh, in that debate. And then I'm going to focus on, on, on China itself uh, after presenting the international evidence on politics and growth in China, and specifically about sort of uh, different growth models. And there are two, uh, rather than just one in, a, in China for the last uh, 30 uh, years of reforms. One is sort of more entrepreneurial, bottom-up, uh, model, growth model, and the other is a top-down state capitalistic model. I will say that the current model is this top-down state capitalistic model, and that model began to prevail over the other model sometime in the 1990s, and, and now it is at the very end of that model. And there's a question whether or not this model is uh, sustainable or not. There are massive challenges associated with that way of running economic system. And essentially, this is what the current leadership is, um, is, uh, needs to uh, grapple with. And then I'm going to talk about the growth prospects uh, and the reforms. I think the view, the consensus view among uh, academics and economists outside of the country, uh, outside of China, is that uh, in the next 20 years, uh, 
it is unlikely that China is going to repeat the kind of reforms, uh, 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 performance that uh, it, uh, the country has put out in the last 30 years, which is growing consistently at nine, eight, nine, ten percent uh, 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 a year. Uh, the consensus view uh, among outside academics is that you know four percent, five percent. Whereas within China, uh, there's a view that it is able to grow at seven plus uh, percentage point. Uh, I'm going to present the view that why the slowdown is very much a real possibility. And uh, you know I can be wrong about the higher growth uh, projection, but I'm going to lay out the facts why the lower estimate is a more reasonable one. The problem with the higher estimate is that you hear the estimate, you don't hear the data and the rationale supporting the higher estimate. So I'm going to lay out uh, the scenario why the growth rate may uh, slow down. It doesn't mean it's a catastrophe. It, it actually depends on uh, two things uh, critically. One is the manner of the slowdown. You know, does it slow down, boom, like this? Or does it slow down like that? It makes a huge difference, the manner uh, with which you slow down. And the other even more important issue is um, you, do, you do not want to slow down in the current model. Right? What is current model? Massive investments, very much uh, reliant on in external market. You don't want to slow down in the current model. But if you slow down in a different model, which is more emphasis on uh, productivity improvements, more emphasis on consumer, consumption driving growth, that's okay. You know, if you grow 7%, six, even 6%, even 5%, that's totally okay. So there are a lot of nuances with, with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with these uh, estimates. And sometimes people just look at the, uh, the, 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 the number without uh, understanding the underlying dynamics. Hopefully some of that will come out in my presentation. And then I'm gonna end on this sort of debate between political reforms and economic reforms. So let me present quickly a global evidence. Uh, in terms of uh, on democracy, we have very good evidence that democracy is very good at protecting rights. I think this is something you know very well, but I want to present, you know, typical of uh, MIT fashion, I actually want to present some data. This is from Steven Pinker, who previously was an MIT professor uh, in psychology. Uh, this is a wonderful book, uh, The Better Angels of Our Nature. 700 pages long, so uh, uh, I, I don't recommend it for its length. But in terms of the uh, empirical materials and richness of the views, it's a really incredible book. What he shows in that book is that in the 20th century, totally, totalitarian regimes resulted in 138 million civilian death, 138 million, of which communist countries, mostly uh, Stalinist China and Mao, uh, Stalinist uh, Russia, Soviet Union, and Maoist uh, China, uh, killed 110 million. I mean, this is a gigantic number. Authoritarian countries, meaning uh, uh, countries that have very strong one-party system, but not all the way to the communist system, such as Brazil in the 60s, and Argentina in the 60s and 70s. Collectively, they resulted in 28 million civilian death. Democracies have also killed. There, there's no question about it. But collectively, we're talking about 2 million. Uh, you know, 2 million is, is too much, but compared with 138 million, it's a very small uh, number. Mostly in the colonies, and includes the civilian death during war uh, bombings. Right? So, uh, so there's fairly strong evidence that democracy protects rights. Does democracy promote growth? Uh, that, that's a separate economic question. The evidence is more mixed. Uh, again, this is global evidence. The best research is done by Robert Barrow, a prominent uh, development economist, um, what he is able to show is that, uh, so on the vertical axis, you have uh, growth rates, and uh, on the horizontal axis, you have an index of democracy. If you just look at 
the the the, the graph uh, where the dots are. Uh, it's hard to see any correlation. It's hard to see, you know, better democracy, better growth. And after all, this is growth. Um, so on the vertical axis, these are growth residues after taking into account uh, the level of the income, the past, the growth rates, uh, capital, uh, labor, and all of that. What's left that's not explained, uh, he's trying to correlate those with uh, democracy. If you really want to see a pattern, what you probably are able to see is an inverted U, which is that countries starting out with low level of democracy, moving toward democracy, they get some growth benefit. But at the high level of democracy, getting more democratic doesn't give you any growth benefits, right? So essentially, if, if, if you force yourself to read a pattern from this graph, that's basically the conclusion that, uh, that you get. More recent research, however, shows that democracy uh, actually does benefit economic growth. And, and this is a more of a methodological debate. Previous research essentially presents cross-country uh, evidence. They have lots of countries uh, in terms of their democracy, in terms of their growth rate. They run correlations, they run regression analysis. The problem with that uh, exercise is that there are a lot of things that are not able uh, to, be, uh, to be controlled for in that type of exercise. You know, some countries, no matter what political system they have, uh, are able to grow, and other countries, no matter what political system they have, are not able to grow. So history, culture, you know, capability. Um, just before this century, I had a discussion with, uh, with, uh, with uh, one of the participants about capacity. All these things are not captured in the cross-country uh, analysis. The more recent research focuses on within-country uh, evidence. That is to say, they look at instances where the countries experience a transition, right? The country before was an autocracy. You know, in year zero, it became a democracy. And then they look at the growth uh, benefits of that change. And that body of research is able to show that democracy, once you go through this transition, gives you growth benefits, right? So after the country has transitioned from autocracy to democracy, you get some uh, growth benefit. Not a lot, uh, but still, unlike the previous research where you can't really see any benefit, you actually uh, here uh, begin to see some benefit. So essentially, per capita GDP grows by 20% over the 30 years after you make the transition. And this is uh, research done by uh, economist at uh, uh, MIT, Darren Osimoglu, who is one of the preeminent uh, economists on, on, on growth and uh, political economy. What's very interesting for China is that this body of research not, doesn't focus on democracy as an established political system. It focuses on transition, right? It focuses on becoming a democracy, what we call democratization. This does have implications for China because China is not a democracy. China may become democracy. So the issue there to debate is whether that transition is, is going to give the country some growth benefits. Apparently, this body of research shows that that transition does produce economic benefits. There's also a separate body of research, and it's too massive for me to cite here. There's a separate body of research showing that social outcomes, public health and public education, all these things benefit from transition as well, from democratic transition as well. But what about Asia, right? Uh, Gunnar Myrdal, who, is, who was a Nobel Prize uh, uh, winner in economics in 1974, wrote a famous book called Asia Drama, right? So what's interesting about Asia is that Asia has a lot of autocracies, right? And, uh, and they have grown very fast, right? India, uh, a democracy, seems to have uh, underperformed. So the question there is whether or not in Asia, at least not global evidence, at least within Asia, uh, democracy really, really delivers uh, growth. So let's just look at Asia. 
So let me give you uh, a tale of two Asian countries. In 1990, country A has a GDP per capita of $317, and country B has a GDP per capita of $461. By 2008, country A has a GDP per capita of $714, and country B has a GDP per capita of $650, right? So you know the conditions of this uh, exercise. Both countries are, Asia, are in Asia, and one of them clearly has outperformed the other, right? Country A, starting out at a lower per capita, GDP level has outperformed country B to become a richer country by 2008. So if the questions are which one is democracy and which are the two Asian countries, you may have, you know, look at this, you say, well, it looks like uh, if you're familiar with the World Bank data, the World Bank data will tell you that in 1990, China had a lower GDP per capita as compared with India. You may say country A must be China, right? It, is, uh, it has a lower GDP per capita. It has outperformed the other country, country B, and country B must be India. It turns out, in fact, country A is actually India, and country B is Pakistan. Uh, so what is very interesting is that whenever people say democracy doesn't deliver by looking at China-India comparison, that's true if you have that pair of comparison. If you compare India with Pakistan, a country that has gone through military dictatorship, periodic uh, democracy, and then uh, autocracy, uh, India has actually done better in terms of uh, GDP performance. And in fact, there's an argument to be made that India-Pakistan comparison is a better comparison. It controls for geography, it controls for history, it controls for ethnic and religious uh, uh, conditions of the two countries, whereas China-India comparison is more stretched uh, because there are lots of other things that are difficult to compare with and control for. But what about the uh, argument that Korea, South Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Singapore have done very well with uh, autocratic system? The problem with that argument with that argument is a selection bias, right? Imagine yourself doing research on the odds of winning lot lottery. The second person comes in, you ask her, did you win the lottery? Yeah, I, I won the lottery, I took a taxi, you know, it was a long, time, long way from home, I, I come here to claim my prize. You, 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 you ask everybody who comes in, everybody tells you he or she has won the lottery. And then you draw the conclusion, winning the lottery the odds are 100%, right? You would say this is a wrong methodology <laughs> because you are only looking at the winners. There's a flavor with the East Asian argument, with well, the same flavor with the East Asian argument, because they only cite the successful East Asian countries that have performed under autocracy. They forgot Burma, right? They forgot the, uh, uh, the Philippines, uh, and for China, uh, Taiwan comparison, China is doing very well now, but in the 50s and 60s and, and 70s, it massively underperformed against uh, Taiwan. Uh, you keep talking about Korea, but North Korea, hey, I can, if you don't believe North Korea is an autocracy, um, you just have to better to believe it. Uh, <laughs> Uh, two years ago, uh, one, of, uh, one minister in the cabinet, the finance minister, exper experimented with the currency reforms, and the reforms didn't produce the anticipated economic uh, benefits, and the minister was executed. Uh, so <laughs> who says uh, autocracies uh, don't have uh, accountability? Um, <laughs> so North Korea didn't perform, South Korea performed. So, this is what global evidence will tell you, right, when we look at uh, the relationship between politics and growth. It is very hard to say that globally, autocracy has a growth benefit relative to democracy. What we can show is that some autocracies have done extremely well, right, such as Korea, such as Taiwan in the 60s and 70s. Other autocracies in Africa, 
did atrociously badly, right? So when you run statistical analysis, the good guys、uh, and the bad guys offset each other, and the result is zero. So it's it's very hard to draw policy conclusions based on statistical analysis. And if you want to draw policy implications from case study analysis, it is very important that you do not commit the selection bias. China, India. Let me try to tell that story in a more nuanced uh, way, uh, rather than just saying one is democracy, the other is not.、Um, so we know for a fact that China has grown so much faster than India. The the reason、uh, that uh, the issue is why. So one、uh, explanation is infrastructure, right? So the in case you can tell which is which. Uh, the uh, this one is China, Shanghai, to be specific, and this is uh, uh, Mumbai. It's very unfair to just select one picture of each、uh, country to make this comparison. But、uh, bear with me for、uh, one second. And there's a lot of praise for the、uh, Shanghai model, right?、Uh, infrastructure and building boom.、Uh, I will call this sort of Shanghai theory of economic growth that puts a lot of emphasis on infrastructures, a strong government, a state capitalism, and government ownership. And by that,、uh, by those criteria,、uh, democracy is hindrance to growth. It's very difficult to build buildings like that when you have millions of、uh, residents. Uh, able to claim their homes and compensate in India, one of the biggest uh, 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 obstacles to infrastructure building is、uh, private ownership of land,、uh, specifically what is known as a hold-up problem. Right? How do you get the last person to move? It's very, very, very difficult without using、uh, the power of the government. In China, there is plenty of、uh, power of the government.、Uh, Uh, the hold-up problem、uh, is happening now, but but it didn't really happen on a massive scale before because、uh, you don't want to hold up against Chinese government. Uh, and uh, uh, there's a there's a joke in Shanghai. They did a feasibility study on the environmental impact of、uh, building a subway line from point A to point B, and the environmental study shows that it does have negative、uh, impact on the. Uh, neighborhood uh, surrounding the, sub, the proposed the subway line, the government said we completely agree. This is an excellent environmental study. So the people who live near the proposed subway line, they have to move.、Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, so that's a.、Uh, how come we didn't think about that solution? <laughs> But here's the question, right? So this is something that、uh, people don't、uh, typically ask:、uh, just how important are infrastructures in terms of facilitating growth? I'm not going to say that it has zero importance; it has some importance. But here's the issue for us to think about: there are two ways of looking at connections between growth and infrastructure. One is that you build infrastructures and you get growth. That's a that's a widespread view, and a lot of、uh, people who visit China and India have implicitly that view of economic growth. The other view is that because the country has grown, and the government has、uh, collected tax revenue, and、uh, the banking system、uh, has、uh, collected the saving assets from the households, the country is better able to build infrastructure, right? By the second、uh, model, the infrastructure is really the result of economic growth, rather than the cause for economic growth. You know, it sounds like academic debate, something that we have all the time in, at, at MIT, but it has massive policy implications, right? Whether or not infrastructures are the reason for the economic growth, or as a result of economic growth, in reality, it's probably both. But it is important. To uh, to uh, attribute just how important infrastructures are as a cause of economic growth, and how important growth is as a cause for、uh, infrastructure building. So let me give you two other countries: country A and country、uh, country one and country、uh, two.
Uh, country A has a lot of infrastructures, a lot of telephones uh, as compared with country two. Country one also has a, uh, a longer system of uh, railways uh, as compared with country two. I won't read the statistic, but you get the gist of, uh, of the comparison. So if I were to ask you, you know, country A is, is which country and country two is which country, you may again think well, maybe country A is China, country two is India, right? India has terrible infrastructures, China has better infrastructures. It turns out that the country that has a lot of uh, phones is actually the Soviet Union. And the data referred to 1989, and two years later, the country collapsed. Um, and this is uh, uh, Premier Khrushchev uh, on the, ha happily on the phone. Uh, probably, yeah, he actually received the phone call when he took a vacation in Crimea in 1963 or 64 that he was uh, deposed by the Politburo. Maybe that's uh, one of the phone calls. Uh, <laughs> Soviet Union produced more steel, you know, highway and all of that as compared with China. But China has taken off since then. Soviet Union has collapsed. So what I'm trying to say is that infrastructure does not guarantee you economic growth. You may be surprised to learn that until the 19, late 1990s, India actually had better infrastructures as compared with China. Longer railway system, uh, longer uh, uh, road system in India, it's a smaller country as compared with China. And this is uh, one of the legacies of the British uh, uh, Empire. They actually built railways and they built uh, roads. Those roads are terrible, uh, but Chinese roads were also terrible uh, as well. So it's very important when you look at the period before economic takeoff, India actually had a slightly better infrastructure system as compared with China today. China has built all these infrastructures as a result of 30 years of incredible economic growth. And I believe that, uh, uh, that, that that's going to happen in India once the growth is going to pick up. So exactly why uh, China has done uh, very well? Um, uh, uh, let me make an additional point about China and India. There are lots of things we don't understand uh, in terms of economic growth. Academics don't, I, at least I can, claim on behalf of the scholarly community, we don't understand what's going on. Some countries are just able to grow no matter what. Other countries are not able to go, grow no matter what. Let's look at China and India during the Cultural Revolution, right? So I was a, a little kid uh, in the 1960s, and China went mad, uh, according to the Time magazine in the 1960s and 1970s. Uh, India was uh, governed by India Gandhi, uh, it had turmoil and all of that, but it didn't experience cultural revolution. Even during the cultural revolution period, China outperformed India in terms of GDP growth by a long shot, right? So it's just, there are just things that we don't understand. Uh, with this amount of political instability, China was still able to grow. So, so there's something about that country and about East Asian region that positions them for growth. Maybe it's the rice, I don't know, chopsticks. And, uh, I'm running out of the explanations, right? And this is actually a, one of the most robust conclusions from uh, many academic studies, uh, which, which is that uh, growth is a regional phenomenon. If you happy, uh, happen to be located in East Asia, you, no matter what system you have, you grow faster than other countries, right? Uh, so there's something about East Asia that positions the country to grow. So this is, this is the point I'm, I'm trying to make. A China, in, uh, the correct China-India comparison is not to compare the actual growth rates of China and the actual growth rates of India. The correct way of comparing these two countries is to say that Chinese potentials are here and say that India potentials are here relative to the Chinese potentials, is China doing better or India, vis-a-vis -vis India doing better or worse relative to its potentials, right? I, I'm not sure I made it very, very clear. So the right way to compare is to compare the countries maximizing 
or not use it, uh, utilizing fully their economic potential, right? That's the right way to look at it. And in India, I would say that, uh, and I'll lay out the reason why, is always going to have a growth disadvantage vis-a-vis -vis, uh, China uh, for reasons that are really, really uh, complex. But let me just, uh, and that has nothing to do with the political system or economic geography, you know, weather and all these things. But there are other things that, uh, that would also position India not very well relative to China. That has to do with human capital. Um, for one reason or the other, China has invested more in human capital. So here I explicitly put more emphasis on human capital rather than on physical capital in terms of explaining growth, right? As I pointed out before, India actually, by some measures, had better physical capital infrastructure as compared with China in the 1970s and 1980s, but India had terrible human capital infrastructure as compared with uh, China. Life expectancy, uh, literacy rate, uh, China, uh, even going back to the 70s, did much better than India. Life expectancy, right? In 1965, if you compare uh, 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 Chinese men with uh, uh, Indian uh, men, uh, Chinese men on average had a life expectancy of 54. Uh, Indian men had the uh, life expectancy of uh, 46, really, really uh, very uh, low life expectancy level. Uh, women, 55 and uh, 44, vis-a-vis -vis 44, right? So, if you have a choice in 1965 to be a Indian or to be a Chinese, definitely you want to be a Chinese because you, you got 10 years uh, more in life expectancy. The problem of making that choice is that next year uh, China gives you a cultural revolution, so you always have to think <laughs> carefully about these uh, choices. But suppose you don't have that choice, but you have a choice to be a woman or, 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 or a man. For Chinese, uh, 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 you are better off being a woman, right? Uh, worldwide, women live longer than men, right? So that's just, that just, that just true. Look at Indian data, right? Uh, for one reason or the other, uh, Indian women had a lower life expectancy as compared with Indian men, right? It really is, is, a, is a powerful piece of evidence of the discrimination, and the, uh, the gender bias in that society. Over time, the country overcame that bias. By 2006, India now has a more normal life expectancy distribution between men and women. So my point here is that why I show the 60s and 70s, uh, uh, 80s data, these are the data that matter for the later economic growth, right? To say that A causes B, the minimum condition is that A happens before B, right? To say Ya Sheng is the son of uh, Ya Sheng's father, minimally, my father has to be born before me, right? I mean, there, there are other uh, things that uh, they are, they are, they are you know, necessary and sufficient conditions, but A has to happen before B. What I'm showing to you here is that the human capital edge that China has had happened before its growth later on whereas the physical capital edge that China has over India happened after the growth, right? So that's more of a result of economic growth. Uh, this is a, a, a picture uh, that is really, to me, is really, really interesting. Um, on, the, on, on one side, you see a textile factory in China, all women, all women. On the other side, you see a textile factory a India, lots of men, right? A and there's very good economic evidence to show that gender equality is positively correlated with economic growth. And this is why Goldman Sachs Foundation started this uh, 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 10,000 women uh, entrepreneurship program. And this is one reason why my mighty Sloan School decided to join the program, because the benefits of gender equality on economic growth, quite apart from social benefits, are substantial. Let me shift gears by, uh, uh, by talking about uh, democracy 
and uh, uh, economic growth. What I want to point out here is that, uh, remember the earlier discussion we had about democratization. Democratization is about direction. It's about country moving from autocracy to democracy. I want to emphasize here is the direction that matters in terms of explaining economic growth. It is not the level. It is not whether or not today you are democracy or autocracy. What matters is that if today you are democracy, whether in the future you become more democratic, if today you are an autocracy, whether or not in the future you become less autocratic, it is that directional change that matters for economic growth. And the evidence is consistent between China and India, which is that when India moved to be more democratic, the growth began to pick up. When China became less autocratic, moving toward direct, uh, democratic direction, the growth began to pick up, right? So it's not the level, it's the direction. Uh, let's look at India very, very quickly. Uh, many people forget that in the 60s and, and, and the 70s, India was actually ruled by a iron lady, uh, India Gandhi, who declared uh, emergency measure in 1975, nullify uh, elections, he actually exercised the federal power to nullify local elections some 23 times, right? And she ran the Congress party in a very much authoritarian fashion. At that time, India, uh, Indian government controlled the media, controlled the TV stations and radio. India began to experience growth uh, pickup in the 1990s and then in 2000s when the country was actually moving more toward democracy. They began to privatize the media. They began to introduce the village self-rule, and the country also implemented freedom of information reforms. So even though India started out as a democracy, I would argue that today India is more democratic than it was before. One additional piece of data that is, to me, that's, that is also very interesting. When the ruling party rules India with a large majority in the parliament, the country tends not to reform, just like the Congress party in the last, uh, last, uh, last uh, cycle, political cycle. When the ruling party has to share power with others, it is actually able to implement many policy reforms, right? So even within the government, more democracy actually allows you to experiment with more policy reforms. In China, in China, let me skip this because uh, I want to get to the, uh, to the state capitalist uh, piece of uh, presentation. In China, you see exactly the same thing. Yes, China today is an autocracy, but it is less autocratic as compared with what China was in the 1960s and 70s. They introduced village elections. They introduced security of the property rights. They introduced long-term land leases to the rural uh, uh, entrepreneurs and there were a lot of financial reforms in rural part of the country. Right? Let me, uh, I know I'm running out of the time, and uh, so let me, let me go more quickly on, on this part of the presentation on state capitalism. The problem with the earlier political reforms in China is that they were not consolidated. In the early 1990s, the country began to make a turn toward more political control and more autocracy. A lot has to do with Tiananmen, which we just uh, experienced the 25th uh, anniversary. I'll be happy to go into that, uh, but let me just say that a lot has to do with that event. Economic growth continued. That's true in terms of GDP growth. What has changed since 1989 is the driver of economic growth. In the 1980s, the drivers of the economic growth were uh, household consumption, right? Uh, entrepreneurship, bottom uh, up entrepreneurship. After the country began to lean toward more political control, the GDP continued to grow, but the drivers of the GDP growth changed dramatically. Now it's investment driven uh, growth, export driven growth, 
energy intensive driven uh, growth rather than kind of this entrepreneurial uh, growth model. I'm going to show you the statistics illustrating very clearly the difference between when China was politically more liberal, right? Uh, consumption driven growth, uh, not using a lot of energy, not using a lot of investments, and more autocratic political model under which China still is able to grow, but using a lot of energy, using a lot of uh, uh, investment resources. So let me show you uh, a graph of two ratios. At the top is the ratio of investment to GDP. As you can see, in the earlier part, in the 1980s, China was investing below 40% of the GDP year in and year out, right? So 35%, 38%. At that level, this is what we call East Asian level. Korea invested at that level in the 1960s and 70s. Taiwan invested at that level in the 60s and 1970s. Right? It's a normal East Asian pattern. And then Tiananmen happened somewhere here. The investment GDP ratio began to rise. This is the first year that exceeded 40%. It began to uh, decline a little bit. And look at the more recent years. Now it's close to 50%, 50%. I don't know whether or not you are shocked by that number. I am. Um, but I was, uh, I was shocked already here, so I kept getting shocked. Um, <laughs> at 50%, no other country in the history of the world, the part of the history of the world for which we have data, in the history of the world invested at this level during the peacetime during the peacetime. No, no other country has ever invested at this level right? during the peacetime. During the wartime, consumption collapse, all you do is to produce tanks. The ratio gets a little bit strange. But during the peacetime, you don't do that. Let's look at the other ratio. And this is the trade balances as a share of the GDP. You are probably familiar with this argument. You know, the Treasury Department would criticize China for manipulating exchange rate. And the view there is that the country is only able, able to grow by relying on cheap exchange rate to subsidize exporters to sell to the United States, to sell to, the United States, uh, to, to Europe, right? You're probably familiar with that argument. Many people forget that in the 1980s, China had an overvalued exchange rate, had an overvalued exchange rate. And the country, except for one year, 1982, run a consistent negative trade balances year in and year out. And yet the country was able to grow. Right? Whereas in the 1990s, the country began to change. Except for 1993, every other year, the country run a positive trade balance. By the, by the eve of the financial crisis in 2007, the ratio almost reached 10% of a massive continental economy. 10% of that trade, positive trade balances. Right? So this view that China relies on subsidized exchange rate, undervalued exchange rate to support growth, that view only applies to China since the 1990s, since the early 1990s, under this more sort of autocratic growth model. The reason is actually very simple. Uh, if I have time, I'll show the data. The reason is that more politically liberal uh, government is able to grow household income, take home pay, better than autocratic political system. Autocratic political system in Soviet Union, in Nazi Germany, uh, and in other countries, they were able to grow GDP, but they were not able to grow household income. The consumption, household consumption, is tied not to the GDP, but to the household income. Right? So what happened in the 1990s is when the country shifted toward more political control, household income as a share of the GDP collapsed, collapsed. China now has one of the lowest 
labor shares of the income、uh, compared with other countries. Whereas in the 1980s, when the country was politically more liberal, the household income growth exceeded the GDP growth, right? And that's why the country was able to grow mostly based on consumption, household consumption. Essentially, this is what we want China to be doing today, which is not to rely on investments, not to rely on exports, but rely on the consumption of 1.3 billion people to power the GDP growth forward. But the political system is unable to do that because there are features of the political system that are not good for household income growth. Let me、uh, show you some、uh, statistics very, very quickly. Uh, this is heavy industry、uh, began to pick up in 2002, right? Just when you see something like this, this is not driven by natural economic dynamics. It's driven by policy, right? This is the energy consumption, right? China was growing the energy consumption. This is measured by kilograms of oil equivalent per capita, and then something happened in 2000. It began to sh、uh, shoot up. Uh, massively, China today accounts for about 37 global carbon emissions, 37 percent of the global carbon emissions, compared with, or maybe 27. U.S. is like、uh, 17 percent,、uh, and the reason has a lot to do with this change in the growth model. Compare with other countries, compare with Brazil, compare with India, you don't see the same pattern in these other countries. You only see this pattern in China. Compared with the United States, right? And what is also interesting is that 80 percent, 85 percent of the Chinese Chinese energy consumption is used by industry, not by the households, right? It's used in production, not in consumption. Electricity uh, uh, consumption, personal electricity consumption,、uh, uh, as a share of total、uh, ele uh, uh, electricity consumption, peaked. At 13% in 2009, right, and then it began to decline. This is the total energy personal consumption as a share of total energy consumption. It's a flat line, you know, about 11%, something like that, throughout this this period, right. The vast majority of the energy in electricity consumption takes place in the production sector of the economy, rather than in the consumption sector of the economy. State capitalism. What's what's good about state capitalism? It is able to build, and and that's why you see the skyscrapers in Shanghai and all of that.、Uh, let me show you additional pictures. Right, Shanghai. We can understand. Shanghai has the richest GDP per capita in China. But let me show you some pictures of the poorest cities in China. And this is a city in Hunan. Five hundred dollars per capita GDP. They build a beautiful building. Well, according to some views of uh, 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 of, uh, of what, what constitutes beauty,、uh, a good building. By the way, every picture I'm going to show you is a picture of a government building. Right? This is not a you know building of Huawei and Lenovo. One thousand dollars per capita GDP. Four hundred eighty-eight dollars per capita GDP. Eight hundred forty-eight dollars per capita GDP. Uh, $1,000 per capita. Every single one of them is a government building.、Uh, this is actually in the same city.、Um, so if you build one, why not build another one?、Um, this is problematic, right? As far as I know,、uh, putting government bureaucrats in a nice building、uh, does not make them less corrupt. Does not improve their efficiency. If you can show me. The data and the argument that building these buildings improves government efficiency. I say go, go for it.、Uh, so at least there has to be some microeconomic benefit from building this kind of uh, uh, of, uh, of buildings. Otherwise, it's a pure waste. It's a pure waste,、uh, and there's a lot of waste in the Chinese、uh, building boom as a result of the state capitalism crowding out the private sector. Exacerbate social tensions through land takings and underfunding social liabilities. Now, just to maintain these buildings costs a lot of money, right? You have less money 
to finance education and public health. These are the true growth advantages for the future growth, right? So this is the problem that I have with state capitalism. It is funding these things that increase the current GDP at the expense of the future GDP growth. Let me show, let me come back. Yes, please. What about the teams that work in gold cities? A gold cities, yes. Empty. I know. It cannot. It, it, so, so, so uh, now what's going on in China is a massive repri repricing of housing assets. Okay? The government is in a bind. They don't want the housing prices to go too much, but they don't want the housing prices to fall to, all the way to the floor. The reason is that, and this is, all has to do with the incentive of state capitalists. The reason why they built these ghost, ghost cities is that the government there uh, previously made massive amount of profits from selling the land to the developers. Right? So they don't care about the demand side. All they care is the supply side. Right? And uh, they compensated these peasants uh, at a very low level Right? You're reducing, or not at least growing, their household income, right? whereas you need to make massive investments in cement, in uh, aluminum, in steel, and all of that. And this is why the investment GDP ratio now is 50%. Right? And uh, let me show you the household consumption as a, GDP, uh, as a ratio of GDP. In the 1980s, during the sort of this more politically tolerant liberal period, the household consumption to GDP ratio stayed at 50%. 50% worldwide is still pretty low, but it's pretty high by Chinese standard. And it is able to stay at that level throughout the decade. And then it began to decline. Now it is at about 35% of the GDP. After the financial crisis in 2008, there was uh, hope that China was able to rebalance away from investment toward household consumption. The latest data, however, do not give you the confidence. The latest data is that the household consumption, again, is trending downward. Right? Here is the problem facing the country right? in terms of rebalancing. You want to raise this ratio very, very high, Right? But imagine going back to the 1980s level from here. This is a huge gap to cover. Right? You need to cut, right? So GDP basically, I hope you still remember from your uh, uh, macroeconomic uh, classes you took at uh, Sloan School. How many years ago? I don't know. And uh, the GDP basically can be expressed in the following identity, right? investment plus consumption plus next, uh, uh, net exports, right? So if the consumption doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't go up uh, to sustain GDP growth, investment has to go up, net exports have to go up, right? But if the investment comes down, net exports come down, the consumption has to go up, right? Here's the problem. In other East Asian countries, when they also wanted to rebalance away from relying on investment, they only had to rebalance from an initial level of 35% of the GDP rather than 50% of the GDP. That's one, one uh, difference between China and South Korea and Taiwan. The second difference is that when those economies invested 35% uh, of the GDP year in and year out, they were running a trade deficit, whereas China is running a trade surplus. So what they did was they rebalanced by reducing the investments and increasing the net exports, right? Because they were uh, having negative trade balances. For China, here's the problem, right? You started out at such a low level, and you have to do two things simultaneously. Right? You have to increase the consumption very, very high, 
and you have to decrease trade positive trade balances、uh, very very quickly, right? And decreasing the investment as a share of the GDP very very quickly. You have to do two things simultaneously. Whereas those、e、other East Asian countries were able to do one thing simultaneously. Here's the dilemma facing the Chinese government in the short run, right? So this is one reason why the GDP growth has to come down. In the short run, there is absolutely no way you can do these two things simultaneously. You either have to maintain high investment, creating a lot of more ghost cities, exacerbating. Economic、uh, efficiency and social tensions, or you have to let GDP growth come down. There's really no third option, right? And、uh, let me let me let me uh, quickly uh, end by I, I have a lot of data.、Um, <laughs> and so so let me just say that this is a new era now.、Um, this is President Xi Jinping, and、um, he's.、Uh, His、uh, era started in. Uh, 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 by the way, this was created by a Chinese uh, 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 internet uh, citizen. Uh, very, very creative. Uh, obviously, uh, as soon as it was posted, it was censored.、Uh, I thought, <laughs> I thought it's a great picture. Yeah. So,、uh, so the Xi Jinping era, the new era, the new leadership has announced very ambitious economic reform programs. And the uh, document uh, that they、uh, released in November 2003 listed no less than 26 areas of major reforms: education, military, and、uh, economic、uh, reforms. The problem, though, is that、um, they want to keep doing two things: they want to keep the state-owned enterprises. There is no plan to privatize the state-owned enterprises, which I view is the one of the two institutional pillars of state capitalism. And they do not want to reform the politics; they want to keep the political control very, very tight, which is another another institutional pillar of state capitalism. They want to do all the things that we talked about in this uh, uh, in this uh, uh, talk. They want to rebalance the economy. They want to introduce more competition. They want to reduce corruption. They want to increase、uh, consumption. They want to do all these things. To me, you need to focus on two things to get to these、uh, policy objectives. One is to privatize the SOEs, and the other is to reform the politics. So far, there is no evidence that the new leadership is willing to do that. And for me, that's not a very good sign. Let me. And by saying thank you, sorry I overrun the time, but I do hope to have、uh, some time for Q and A. Yes, please, sir. I'd like to humbly suggest that you may be missing a major factor,、okay. maybe the most important factor, that's encouraged. Uh, really developing in the West that has not developed there, and that's gender gender equality. We have been we're undergoing a major change in this country in terms of increasing the importance of women's influence on policy on economics in this country, and I think it's going to make a major difference.、Uh, looking around the room now, I see that the Song School has has a large Gap to still fill. <laughs> MIT is making major steps in this advance in this direction, and I think it's going to increase the academic standard of the institution. But I think the major factor that we're going to receive is the influence of women, and there's a major reason for this, a very fundamental one. When we were growing up, women had one major advantage over us. They were taught how to listen. Males were taught how to express themselves and make their thoughts known. And I think this is going to make a major difference in the way we function. Yeah. So let me let me just say that I 100% agree with you.、Uh, the only part I guess I disagree with is you said I I, I missed the, <laughs> the, the the the. I actually spent about two slides on on that topic.
And, and a lot of people don't uh, emphasize enough this difference between China and India, which is that China has better gender equality as compared with India. Uh, uh, people tend to emphasize the physical capital difference between China and India. They say that's the difference why China is able to perform. I actually say, no, 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 that's not the difference. The difference is actually the gender equality difference between China and India. And actually, I have some statistics uh, to show that. And this is one reason why we joined the Goldman Sachs Foundation program to support uh, women uh, entrepreneurship. I 100% uh, agree with, maybe I didn't make it clear uh, in, the, in the presentation, but I, I agree with that uh, completely. Yeah, thank you very much for that, uh, for that view. Yes. So the, Robbie? Yeah. Okay. So it looks like China has got an impossible situation of, I mean, close to, uh, of both uh, increasing the household consumption, you know, consumer-driven economy, and uh, rebalancing investment and export-import, uh, I mean that, and managing the currency, of course, these are all related. Yeah. So, I mean, is that a way at all? I mean, if, if you take that view that's close to impossible, there has to be, not only slow down on GDP, there may have to be some substantial, discrete, uh, you know, I don't want a catastrophic economy. Some, Black some swan, yeah, so. Yeah, some, some serious shock yeah. to the economy uh, and the society. I mean, would that be a wrong assessment? I mean, or do you see some way of doing this? Well, I, I, I think it's an impossible situation in only in the following sense, which is that you still want to grow at 9%, 10%, 8%. For me, there's nothing wrong with a country able to grow five, six percent sustainably over a long period of time using household consumption. For, for a country the size of China, right, a self-contained continental economy, if you're Singapore, right, yes, I understand you rely very heavily on external market. You're China, you're Brazil, you're India, you're Russia. You should rely on the domestic market as the primary cause for economic growth. There's nothing wrong with the country growing as five, six percent, seven percent a year if the growth driver is a more efficient driver, right? So I didn't show the other, uh, the other slides that show the impact of productivity uh, growth in the Chinese uh, growth uh, equation. Productivity has played a very small role in terms of the Chinese uh, GDP growth. It's just massive investments, a lot of labor, what we call factor accumulation model. State capitalism is very good at that uh, model. Productivity growth uh, is, is very small and is, is actually to the extent we have data, the productivity growth, contribution to the growth is coming down, right? So there's nothing wrong with the country growing at 5%, 6% sustainably for a long period of time with household consumption as the driver and then productivity growth uh, uh, on the demand side and the productivity growth on the, on the supply side. If China is able to grow at that le uh, uh, with that kind of configuration, I don't worry about the, about the country. I worry about the country in the following sense. They still want to pursue this top line GDP growth, right? And recently, uh, as soon as there's uh, evidence that the repricing of the housing markets is, is uh, becoming more substantial, they put more administrative measures stopping the repricing of the house, uh, housing market, and they are beginning to loosen the monetary uh, policy, right? Uh, for me, what's more important is to do the reform. By the bullet, you have a number of years of lower growth. By the bullet, implement these reforms rather than continuing with the status quo, right? If they do continue with the status quo, then I do worry about the things that you, you laid out. The social tensions are going to rise. Uh, the banking system is going to be saddled with bad uh, debt, non-performing loans. It doesn't mean that China is going to have a Lehman-style crisis because the banking system there doesn't operate uh, on a market uh, uh, basis. But many people mistake the absence of a financial crisis with the absence of economic costs, right? These are not two, two different things. You can have a bad financial system without having a financial crisis, 
But the evidence suggests that if you don't have financial crisis, you typically have low growth. You cannot escape from low growth. This is what I worry about, whether or not the current leadership is going to continue with the current uh, methods of doing things. Sir, there's a Actually, question. Right should we have a question here in the back? Oh, OK. The light is so strong. Oh. Uh, Hi, Professor Hong. OK, yes, yes. Uh, so is the idea that the trend towards or against democracy is always going to impact um, economic growth? Or is that uh, connected to a certain level of democracy? For example, is there any evidence that after 9-11, for example, where the US and most other Western uh, countries uh, walked uh, away for, uh, uh, from um, civil rights significantly, yeah. and so I would say this is a, a strong step against the democratic world. Would that have any impact on the on the growth of those countries for the following years, or the threshold is high enough that the doesn't matter? You mean anymore? the Arab Spring? Arab Spring, when that region experienced democracy and uh, well, that too, right? Yeah. Like smaller trends, but well, I would say in the U.S. and the European Union after 9/11 you had all these suppressions of civil rights, like people being, okay. uh, being the yeah. act and things like so, that. So let me, let, me, let me answer that question by, by saying that as a Chinese, I have a very low standard for democracy. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, 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 I remember in the uh, 1980s, there was a North Korean student uh, who had to return back to North Korea. And he cried. He said, I really don't want to go back to North Korea. China is so democratic, right? So it's, it's uh, a... <laughs> Democracy is in the eye of the beholder, uh, and uh, I, you know, I, 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 so let me say I don't really know the answer to your question whether or not the erosion of the rights in the West is so substantial to impact growth, right? And you know, for me, as just to my own personal taste, uh, I think this rights-based view of uh, democracy. I wouldn't want to see a complete replication of that model in developing countries, right? That gun rights and all of that. So I think the rights-based view of democracy is really one view to organize democracy, but in developing countries, they are also suffering from lots of other problems like lack of a government capacity to provide basic goods, right? Uh, so I, what I can say is uh, about developing countries, the more, most important thing is that the democracy uh, imposes trans some transparency requirements on the ruling elites, uh, imposes some limitations on corruption, right? So if you look at the most corrupt uh, autocrats in the history of the world, every single one of them was in the, in the, in the authoritarian uh, government. We're talking about, there's a Transparency International report about Mobutu and people like that collectively they, uh, they, uh, they pillage their countries, poor countries, $50 billion, right? So I'm not saying democracy totally gives you corruption-free environment, but it's going to curtail that kind of uh, corruption for developing countries, right? Sorry, I gave you a long answer, but it's totally irrelevant to your uh, question. We have a <laughs> That's how professors are trained to answer questions. <laughs> uh, yes, please. Yeah. Yeah. Mike, Mike Garcia, class of 94. Yeah. Um, you've talked about the state and the government, but I, I haven't heard you mention the word the Communist Party of, uh, of China. Yeah. Um, a well-known professor in the, in the school up, up, the, uh, up the river, um, wrote, uh, Graham Allison wrote a book on the essence of decision where he highlighted yeah, yeah. you can't just think about the rational action of a, of a state, sure. who are the individual actors and yeah. the institutions such as the party. The party's clearly played a role in this economic growth model. Yeah. And to your last response, clearly has probably been the primary beneficiary of the, of the corruption. Do you see the party evolving, or the leadership of this generation or the next generation of the party beginning to think along the lines that you're thinking? Or what, what's, what's, how do you see that playing it, out? It's actually, when you talk to some of the researchers and intellectuals within the Chinese Communist Party, they don't you know, aggressively disagree with this view of uh, interpreting Chinese uh, growth. Uh, but they also say that, uh, I, I think if there is a disagreement, I would, I would say uh, 
that they over attribute, uh, they overlay attribute their own role in the economic growth. If you look at the earlier period of uh, Chinese economic growth, it was really the Communist Party letting go that led to the, the, the growth. Later on, the party began to play a more direct organizational role in terms of these massive infrastructure buildings. I'm not going to say all the airports in China are, are a waste of resources, but clearly from the pictures that I've, I've shown, uh, there is probably a uh, level of waste in the Chinese investment drive. So, so I would argue that the party's role in terms of its positive and negative uh, the balance of that role is increasingly trending toward more negative functions, building all these uh, buildings that don't have uh, direct social payoff, that undermine the future economic growth, undermine microeconomic efficiency. That negative role of the party is increasingly overtaking the sort of this minimum organizational stabilizing role of the Chinese Communist Party. I would say collectively, Chinese Com Communist Party doesn't see it that way. You know, if you look at the expansion of the Chinese Communist Party, it has expanded dramatically in the last uh, two decades. Uh, now, the membership is 80 million strong. Uh, <laughs> 80 million, that's a lot of people. Uh, 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 sometimes people say, yes, uh, there are more stockholders in China than the number of the party, uh, uh, Communist Party members. And then I responded by saying, but many of them, many Communist Party members also speculated on the stock market. So it's really kind of a Venn diagram. There's a huge overlap between the two populations. And so it has expanded dramatically. If you look at the, the more recent policy document uh, uh, describing the visions of the current leadership, they put a lot of emphasis on party control, right? So officially speaking, I don't see any movement toward the view that I laid out here even though when you talk to them individually, they may agree with one or two pieces of the analysis. I just think that collectively it's very difficult for a party like that to come out and say, hey, we're actually you know, doing a lot of damage. It's very hard for the ruling party to do that. Um, yes, sir. Um, going back to your notion that uh, the process directionally of democratization is what generates growth. Yeah. Uh, and you know, beyond the, some of the s simplistic, obvious things like building out your court systems and things of that sort, what's your hunch as to the underlying mechanism there? Yeah, okay. What, what is it that's really going on that during that you part of the curve, yeah. you generate economic growth? What, yeah. what, what's the mechanism there? Yeah, that's an excellent <coughs> question. <coughs> There, uh, there are some mechanisms specific to China. There are some mechanisms that we have observed in, in other countries. Uh, for China, what we have seen is that um, the, when you have some kind of basic democracy, rudimentary democracy, the, 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 the people who have the most to gain from that are the rural Chinese. And in the 1980s, they were 80% of the population. And think about the communist model, you know, in Stalinist uh, Soviet Union, in Maoist Asia. They were able to industrialize by taxing the rural residents very, very heavily. Basically, that's how the communist uh, system industrialized uh, uh, themselves. Uh, by giving some democracy to the rural Chinese, they have a say over the allocation of financial resources, so they don't get exploited that way, right? And if you have 80% uh, of the Chinese who are rural residents, how they consume things matters a lot collectively for the macro development in terms of the consumption GDP ratio. I would say that's one. The other thing is that Think about communist system. Uh, communist system is strongest in the urban areas, right? Uh, in the Soviet Union, that's the case. In China, that's the case. In Beijing and Shanghai in the 1970s, you had zero entrepreneurship left. Nothing, nothing left. Everything was uh, nationalized. In the countryside, you actually had some entrepreneurship, 
right, in the rural China. Actually, there was one peasant in China, and this is what I found when I was going through these archive uh, uh, stuff. Uh, there was one peasant in China in the 1970s who made uh, millions of uh, Chinese uh, uh, currency, uh, RMB, uh, by going into the production of producing Chairman Mao buttons. Uh, <laughs> he was very entrepreneurial. He saw a huge market. Uh, it was a politically captive market. Uh, and, and he went into the production. The urban factories were, had all sorts of inefficiencies. They couldn't really adjust the supply and demand, and, and, and he did it, uh, all of it. So in the rural area, in the rural area, there was quite a bit of entrepreneurship. When you combine the financial allocation in favor of the rural area with the entrepreneurship risk-taking, you know, that kind of attitude, you have this incredible boom uh, in China. In other countries, what we have seen is that when the government is more democratic, they tend to focus on social things, right? They focus on education, they focus on, on health, uh, some on gender equality. Those things have a foundational contribution to economic growth, but it also means that because they focus so much on the social things, they focus less on economic things. When you focus less on economic things, hopefully you unleash entrepreneurship, you unleash the market, you unleash private initiatives. I'm not saying it happens all the time, right? But what I'm saying is that for those countries that have repressed entrepreneurship before, democracy helps liberate that uh, entrepreneurship. So both on the social side, it's a contribution to a growth, on the microeconomic side, you have more entrepreneurship, private sector activity. It's also a contribution to growth. That said, I'm not going to say that democracy is unambiguously good for economic growth. Obviously, for India, this is one of the biggest problems, right? So for me, I like to see China, India, somehow, there's a term called Qingdia, right? I actually hope Qingdia is a real country. It combines the strength of China, the capacity, the government uh, capacity to uh, build the big things, including social projects, as well as infrastructure, with a you know, little bit of transparency, a little bit of democracy, election of India. The problem is that it's very hard to combine the strength of these two systems uh, uh, together. You kind of have to go either that way or the other way. For India, the biggest problem is, is the capacity of the government to supply not just infrastructures, but to supply basic education, basic health. There are a lot of people at MIT who have done work on education in India, health in India. It's a mess, it's a mess. So I would argue that they should really address those things first before thinking about that picture that I showed you about Shanghai, you know, the, the skyscrapers. The, the simple fact is that, look at India. This is a country that has a chronic uh, government budget deficit, union government uh, deficit consolidated federal government and the local government to the tune of about eight, nine percent of the GDP, year in and year out. It just doesn't have the kind of capacity to build highways and airports, quite apart from land issues and all of that, right? Essentially, when you spend a lot of money building those things, by definition, you're going to spend less money on basic education and basic health, right? To me, what is really constraining Indian growth it's not the airports, it's not those things. Those will happen automatically later when the growth picks up. It's really the education and health. I would argue Indian government should do more on those things and you know, temporarily maybe forgo some of the airport building and infrastructure building. Uh, how many questions should I take? Uh, one, more question. one more question. Oh, okay, so yes, please. Uh, yeah. Uh, what do you need, John? Microphone. Microphone. President Wang, so one thing you did not talk about in your speech was uh, the one-child policy, which I think sure. bring a huge impact in the demographics of yeah, Chinese yeah, yeah, societies yeah. and work yeah. like labor force, and uh, especially there's a generation growing up with the internet, all yeah. these information flows. So what kind of impacts do you think that would bring, this policy would bring to the uh, general political uh, agenda or to the uh, economic growth in the coming decades? 
Yeah, so that's an excellent question. Uh, I, I, well, first of all, if China were a democracy, it couldn't implement the one-child uh, policy. India Gandhi tried to do that, uh, and she failed, uh, uh, failed dramatically. In terms of its impact on, 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 on economics and politics, I think the impact works through expectations. Uh, you know, I, I have. A brother, so I, I'm not a one-child uh, person. Uh, but research tends to show that. I, I hope uh, people here are not uh, one-child. Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, come from uh, you yourself are not one-child. But research shows that one-child tends to be more selfish, uh, and uh, tends to be inward-looking, uh, and tends to focus on short-term things. That has, politically, that has worked for the Chinese government, right? What you want after Tiananmen is a generation of people looking more at the things they can look at, you know, economic benefits, economic growth, and things like that, rather than at these abstract things. In the 1980s, you know, the Chinese, you know, I was, I was a student, I was actually in Tiananmen. Uh, I was working uh, with the World Bank uh, in Beijing. And, and so a lot of us in the 1980s debated about politics and, and, and economic growth and all of that. I don't get the sense that the current generation in uh, young people in China debate these things. But on the other hand, their expectations are high, and uh, it's OK when you have high growth. The true test is going to come when you have low growth. You know, what is it that the young people are going to do when you have low growth, when you have massive unemployment, when you have the kind of jobs that do not meet your expectation? It's really remarkable when I talk to professors in Chinese universities. A lot of the young students today in China refuse to take a job because the job somehow is viewed as beneath them. So they, they are willing to go for zero income. Essentially, they're living off their parents' savings, their, their parents' savings. I'm not sure that's going to be sustainable when the GDP growth comes down because the parents are able to save only because their income growth is, 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 is non-zero, right? It's a positive number. Then they can save, save a fraction of their income to sustain themselves as well as their, their, their kid. So it's going, to, it's going to be very volatile, I believe, if uh, the GDP growth. So a lot of it turns on the GDP growth and how you grow the GDP, right? The peasants, uh, and the other thing that I have heard in China is that you know, some people will tell me, oh, professor, you worry about young people, you worry about the peasants uh, sort of being forces of uh, political instability. They say, what about these bureaucrats, right? The bureauc there are a lot of bureaucrats. They're not going to be very happy when the GDP growth uh, comes down. They, now they derive a lot of income from all these uh, uh, projects. That income is going to be zero when the GDP growth comes down. So there are a lot of different elements in the society that, become, that can become a force of uh, instability once the GDP growth comes down. I would argue that this is the time to introduce democracy. The good thing about democracy, right? Well, the, both good and bad, right? Look at the elections in this country. You know, apparently you can get elected by talking about uh, gun rights and, and these non-economic things, right? And uh, social things. And, and so what's good about uh, a de democracy is that the criteria to judge your performance are not just one-dimensional, right? It can be multi-dimensional, right? You can say, I failed on economics, but hey, I deliver on these other things. When the GDP growth is trending down, that's what you want to do as a rational politician, right? You want them to think about you not just a, as a bureaucrat able to deliver economic growth. You want them to think about you maybe to repair the roads, uh, I don't know, to make the trains run on time. You want to be judged on these other things. So I would say that this is the time to introduce democracy rather than going the other way around. On that, thank you so much. Thank you.